It's good to be here on the Sabbath morning, that's for sure. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Evan Ellis, and I'm the principal at Christchurch Adventist School, and it's really good to be home again. It's also really good to see children and to celebrate children. Um, being in education, you can understand I'm a little bit passionate about um, children and education. Speaking of that, as you're aware, we have um, 16 schools through New Zealand, um, and our schools are doing really well. I think um, Stephen's involved at our school in Auckland, aren't you, Stephen? Yep, board chair, I believe. So he will understand some of the um, challenges that we face, but also the blessings that we have. Um, at the moment, our school's accepting enrolments for next year, and this is just to explain a bit of the challenge that we have. We are going to have to decline over 40 applicants simply because we haven't got space, we can't take them. Our communities value the education which our schools offer, which is why pretty much all of our schools throughout the country are pretty much full. So please keep them in your prayers. Our schools do a fantastic job, so I was glad that the offering today also was going towards education and the work that's done in Longburn. Our schools exist to help our kids um, come to know and love Jesus better. That's our primary reason for being there, and we do that well. The other thing is, as we know, schools are there to educate. Um, we have three high schools throughout the country, and all of our schools achieve results above the national average, and when you compare them to the decile groups they're in, they always way out achieve their, um, the norms that are set. Our school in Christchurch can have a little bit of a bragging right here. For the past five years, we've had 100% um, achievement at all levels of NCEA. Um, while yes we've got good teachers, I don't believe that the results are solely because of that. I firmly believe that God blesses his schools. Our, our kids take time in his word, praising him, and I think God says, let's pour out a blessing on this school because it's representing me. But please keep, keep our schools in, in your prayers. Our families need your prayers. Um, it's not an easy time to be bringing up children. There are many challenges in many ways. And also pray for the staffing of our schools so that we can find and continue to find quality Adventist teachers for our, for our children. Um, as, a, as a teacher, a thing which you would often see in a, on a whiteboard in a classroom is a thing called a WALT. And a WALT says, we are learning too. So I thought I'll quickly try and do that for us this morning. This morning, and you being the classroom, we are learning too. And hopefully this will go. So the title is focused on eternity. Home is the goal. Homesickness is going to be a, a theme which runs throughout the sermon, which is following on from the children's story this morning. And what was God's plan for us? And his plan for us is that we would be home with him. And we're going to look at how to get home. We have to go through Egypt, and we'll have a, a brief look at Joseph and his, his journey. By way of interest, can I see the hands of those of us here this morning who were born in the Auckland area? How many of us is Auckland pretty much home to? Okay. So clearly this isn't home to everybody. Um, how many people would consider the place where you're living now to be home? Yep, some would. Ho home is a very interesting thing because I get a little bit confused. When I'm here and I talk about home, I'm talking about Christchurch. When I'm in Christchurch and I talk about home, I'm talking about Auckland and Papakura and where mum and dad are. So home is a, I don't know if you experience that same um, difficulty at times. But what I want you to do is, is think. And we're going to think on three little things here. Firstly, I want you to think about a physical place. And imagine in your mind, if I say home, in your mind, where do you imagine? Secondly, what I want you to imagine 
is when I say home, who do you see being there with you? And third, that could be parents, children, loved ones, who's there with you? And thirdly, what is the environment like? Is it happy? Is it sad? Is it, what's it like? When you're thinking of home in that way, can I see the hands of those people who are going to be heading there after the sermon is finished? And that's what I'd suspect for a lot of us. While a lot of us are going home to what we call home, there are lots of aspects about where we go that isn't really home. Another question for you. How many of you here have experienced homesickness? Good, I'm not on my own. I definitely experience homesickness. Um, I, I always long for home. Home is a place that I long for. One of the times when I experienced homesickness was when I left home for the first time and went to Avondale College. I packed my bags, jumped on the plane, and when I arrived and got, was shown to my room, got there and started to open up my bag and fold it open and my bag was beautifully packed. As you can tell, I didn't pack it, my mum had packed it to make sure that everything would fit in and I was thinking well, if I go through security and they search my bag, I've got no idea how I'm going to get it all back in. As I opened up the bag, some emotions started to hit. And I thought, this isn't good even, pull yourself together, you need to distract yourself, get some fresh air. So I thought, right, I'll, I'll leave the unpacking till a bit later. Back in those days, we would write letters. And mum and dad had written a letter to Dr. Alan Lindsay, and it was to invite him to come over here to do a, um, a church camp for us. So I thought, right, point of distraction, I'll race off, find Dr. Lindsay, hand him the letter, and, and all will be well. When I found Dr. Lindsay and I sat down in his office, as for those of you who know Dr. Lindsay, he's a very um, personable person. He opens up his door and next thing he's asking, you know, how's the family and that? And next thing all of those emotions just, they were right there again. Fortunately, Dr. Alan Lindsay had a good supply of tissues um, and a good supply of wise wisdom as well. I can assure you that was not the last time that I experienced homesickness and while it doesn't hit so strongly, you can ask Serena, my wife, whenever I'm here and I'm ringing her up and saying, why can't we move back to the beautiful hills, the warmer climate where, you know, you just plant a plant in the ground, leave it, come back two years and it's bearing fruit. Um, Canterbury doesn't seem to do that for my fruit for some reason. Um, and even when I'm down there, I, I long to be home. And I tell the people down there in Canterbury, I say, do you remember the story about Abraham and Lot? When they had to divide and they had to choose, and Abraham Lot, um, Lot chose to take the, the flat land, the plains, and we know what happened to Lot and what was happening down there on the plains. Give me the hills with Abraham any day. I miss home and I'm glad to be home. Do you ever long to be home? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be present here with us. And Lord, that we will learn more of your love for us and your desire and your plan, I pray in your name. Amen. Our opening scripture this morning is found in Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 and 25. Let's read it together with me. You can follow along on the screen and read. we'll all read. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Do you realise what you've just read? A man so determined to get home that he said, even if I have to go out of here with you carrying my bones, get me out of here and take me home. 
Just how determined are you to get home? I mean, you know we aren't home yet. Even though Auckland and Papakura in this area is a beautiful place to live and it's got lots to offer, it's not home. The question is, how badly do you want to get home? And how focused are you on eternity? And are you so focused on eternity that there's nothing that will keep you here when it's time to go? Often we refer to God's book, to the Bible, as being made up of a number of books. How many books in the Bible? That's right, 66. But to think of them simply as a collection of 66 independent books is not correct. The Bible is clear on this. In 2 Timothy 3.16 we read, All scripture is given. How? By inspiration of God. So the Bible comes from one mind. It has one goal, one purpose, one story. And that's the plan of God to save man. And one of the themes that we find that runs through this is God's desire for us to be home. The Bible begins with God giving us a home and it ends with God restoring a home to us where we will dwell together. All through the 66 books, God has never changed his mind. He wants us with him. God is not satisfied that I am here and he is there. It's one of the main themes of the Bible. And so Genesis is the beginning of this journey. In Genesis 2 verse 8, we read, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put a man who he had formed. Do you get the picture? God prepared a place for us. We're talking about a home, a garden home, one that you can't imagine or comprehend. The best of foods are right there, ready to be picked. The sweetest, tastiest, most nutritious of food. And as for the automatic climate control, it's second to none. The temperature is always perfect and the humidity always perfect. The food, the grass, the water, whatever is needed is provided for them by God. They belonged there. And then comes chapter 3, and, and we know the sad, sad story of chapter 3. And at the end of the story, chapter, in verse 23, we read, Therefore the Lord God sent them out of the garden. We had just read before that the Lord had placed them there, and now he's sending them out. Try to understand the heartbreak of God. The God who placed them there, who fashioned them, had built Eden for them, and now the Lord has to dispossess them of their place. Verse 24 says that he drove them out. That shows that there was some resistance. They were pleading, they were crying, Please, Lord, please don't do this. And in agony we can hear God respond, You've got to go. You can't stay. I placed the tree of life here. You can't have continued access or else you will perpetuate the pain of sin forever. You have to go. The Hebrew word, for the, the Hebrew word used for the verb drove is a powerful word, yagaresh. It is almost as if the angels were having to drag them out of the garden. And we can hear them saying, sin has stained your mind, it stained your body, your thoughts, your whole being and your frame. You cannot stay here. This same God who placed them lovingly in their home, and we're not sure how much longer before, now has to kick them out. He has to banish them. They traded eternity for time. They had eternity. They were to live forever. They had the tree of life. They were never to go to sleep in death. They had already been given as a gift eternity, and for a bite of the forbidden fruit, 
They said, we prefer time to eternity. They had lost their focus. They were not, and we were not, created for time. We were created for eternity. And God is trying to get us back on track. Our struggle is remembering why we were created. We were not created to be sick. We were not created to be mad. We were not created to be tired. We were not created to be mean to each other. We were not created to die. We were created to be healthy, to be whole, to have a sound mind and body. You are somebody created in God's image. You don't belong down here. Sometimes we feel this lack of belonging down here quite strongly and, and we can feel alienated. Recently I attended the ENZAX, which is the New Zealand Association of Christian Schools. I attended their conference and one of the speakers spoke about this and he said, often with what is happening in the world we can feel like aliens. And sometimes we can regret living here. And he said, but a better way to consider ourselves instead of aliens is to consider ourselves as ambassadors. You see, as ambassadors, we are here representing our homeland. And as ambassadors, we get to come into the embassy, which is the church, where we can talk with fellow ambassadors and be encouraged. And then during the week, we can go back out and share with others the fantastic news about our homeland. And the other fantastic thing about being ambassador is that you have the full backing and total support and all the resources of your home country available to you. Isn't that a fantastic promise? Carrying on in the story, Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, we read, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In just a few short chapters, mankind has become debased. Sin, like a disease, sin like the COVID virus, like the coronavirus, has, has spread throughout the entire human race. And God is having a hard time finding somebody sane enough to be saved. And the Lord was grieved, we read. His heart was filled with pain. The Lord who placed them in Eden, who had made this place for them, the Lord who had shaped them in his image. The Bible says, I am sorry I breathed into that clay. This is a mess. And he searches a planet, seeking out somebody that he can save. And the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. May God find grace, may we find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Maybe God said, I can save a handful. Because man has lost his focus on eternity. You see, time as we know it, time is a disease. Time is a disease. Time shapes us. Time commands us. Nobody wants to be late. At least most of us don't. But time is a disease and it forces us. By the time you're five, you've got to have started school. By the time you're ten, you'll want to have done this. Eighteen, then thirty, you want to have this job. By the time I'm fifty... Time pushes us on. It is a dictator. The older I get, the more I realise this to be true. And the more you start to hear about people's bucket lists, how time is dictating to them. Doing what needs to be done. But we lost our focus on eternity. So because of this, God had to set up in the minds of his people, in the minds of his church, a journey. And we are now involved in a process, in a journey. We have to get to what Adam and Eve were created for. They were created to be home with God. They sat in the evening and they would talk with God face to face. Nothing between them. No fear. 
Adam could look God straight in the eye and he could say, how, was, how does the eye work? And God could tell him and Adam would remember and never forget. Imagine that. I wish my students could be like that and I wish I could be that good a teacher as well. Man was created for big things, not just small stuff. We were not created to count our lives in minutes, but in eons. Imagine that. And so, God had to, let his pe- had to get his people started on a journey. In Genesis 12, verse we r- 1, we read, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Get out of your country, from your family, to a land I will show you. In other words, Abraham, you are not home yet. As we know, Abraham is the father of the faithful. So his experience symbolizes our experience. So just as Abraham was called, so we have been called to get out of this country, out of our family's house, and go to a land that he shows us. Hebrews makes it very clear that Abraham was not just travelling to Canaan. It says he waited for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. You can't forget that. That is the journey that we are on. Jesus understood this journey. And that's why he says in John 14, verses 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house house are many mansions, or many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then here comes the phrase that lets me know that I'm not home yet. I go to prepare a place for you. If God is preparing a place for you, it means you are not home yet. I'm not home yet. He's working on a place for me because I've not found where I belong. No matter how nice things are here, this is just a dingy motel on the way to the home that God has prepared for you. And then God gets personal about it. He says... That where I am, there you may be also. God is restless. Why? Because we are down here and he is up there. He's upset. Why? Because we are separated. He's distressed. Why? You are in pain. You've got problems. Our minds are troubled. Our bodies are wearing out. God wants you where there's peace. He wants you where there's no pain. He wants you with him in eternity. So he is preparing a place for you. Now when you study the Bible and read the Bible, you'll notice that to get to the promised land, you have to go through Egypt. Abraham had to stop there. Joseph, we know, he had to go through there. Moses had to go back through Egypt to lead the people to the promised land. Even Jesus went through Egypt. Joseph's family went into Egypt as free people, 70 of them. Later on, the Bible tells us that a new king, a new pharaoh came who knew not Joseph. History tells us That when Joseph went into Egypt and rose to his position, the people running Egypt were the Hyksos, and they were not natural Egyptians. They were an Asiatic people who we believe were related to the Jews. So therefore it was more natural for them to accept Joseph to rise to the position of becoming prime minister as a Jew. Then there was a coup, and the natural Egyptians took back over and so Pharaoh, and so a Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph. Now while they were in Egypt, they became Egyptianized. 
Auckland is Egypt. New Zealand is Egypt. Now life is not all bad in Egypt. Remember, for a number of years, they were the private herdsmen of Pharaoh. And they had the land of Goshen. As we know, it was a very fertile and productive land, probably the best there was around. Genesis 47, 27 tells us, So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, where they had possessions there, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Then in time, they were slaves in Egypt. They became more than slaves in Egypt. They became slaves to Egypt. There are things about life in Egypt. I live in Egypt. You live in Egypt. And life's not all bad here. We've got a comfortable home, maybe a car or two in the garage. There's all of the gadgets and food that we need for our comfort. Egypt's not all that bad. It wasn't bad for, for Joseph. Okay, it was at first, but as Prime Minister, a private limo, chariot, servants, married to the high priest's daughter, a nice house, nice food, a nice yard. Egypt's not all bad. But what you don't realise is this. While in Egypt, you become Egyptized, and you find yourself praying with less fervour. We used to pray fervently, even so, come Lord Jesus. Then you find yourself not quite concerned about when he comes. And, and we pray, come when you feel like it, Lord, because in the meantime, I've got business deals to make. I've got holidays to go on. I've got family to meet up with. Lord, don't rush, because life's not all bad here in Egypt. The worst thing that can happen to us is Egypt. When Jacob and his sons went in, all 70 of them, they did not realise that they would be in Egypt for 400 years. Did you expect to be home in heaven by now? Could it be that God wants to make sure that we've not become so Egyptized to the point that we have no desire for him to come? So he waits and tests and allows things to happen. So we remember that this is not home. Joseph said, if I don't get out of here alive, take my bones out of here. He knew he wasn't home. Joseph had gone from prison to palace, from pain to prosperity, from rejection to ruler. The church has become prosperous, beautiful buildings, and there's nothing wrong with that. But one day, God will surely burn it all up. Doesn't it worry you that some churches spend so much time and energy arguing about the colour of the carpet that's going to burn? Remember, it will be burned up. Egypt is not your home. This is just a place I'm going through. Don't forget it. We must stay focused on eternity. 1 John 2 verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. There are some nice places here. I've been to some of them and you've been to some of them. And sometimes we just want to stay there. There are lots of subtle things here in Egypt that make us want to stay. But Joseph, with all that Egypt had to offer, remembered that it wasn't home. And he said, when you leave, when you finally head home to the promised land, don't leave my bones in Egypt. I don't want any part of me in Egypt. In Exodus 13, verse 19, we read, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Moses said Joseph knew he wasn't home. The Israelites, they're, 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 they're packing up. The ten plagues have fallen on Egypt. Pharaoh has been humbled. The Egyptians are praying for them to go. They're there collecting payments from their neighbours. They're in a hurry because they fear that Pharaoh will change his mind again. And Moses says, wait on. We've got to stop here. 
There's a tomb. We've got to stop by and we've got to get the bones of Joseph out of that tomb. He wants to go home. Go forward with me in your minds to a day in the future. Maybe by that time I will be sleeping and my bones will be in Egypt. But on that day when God calls his people to go home, he's going to say to an angel, Hey, we can't leave Evan behind. Somebody go to his grave and grab his bones. But it's going to be better than Joseph. My bones are going to come back together. My legs will form and carry me. My eyes will see. My ears will hear. I will be back together. And I'm going home for the final time. God paints the picture of this for us. He says it's going to be a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The Bible tells me there's going to be no more pain, no more sickness, no more crying, no more death, no more funerals, no more fighting, no more war. Everything is going to be just like God planned when he first put us here in Eden. Finally, finally eternity will be yours, eternity will be mine. Some days I just can't wait. God knows where I belong. He made me for eternity. With all this to look forward to, let me ask you a question again. Are you so focused on eternity that there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that would keep you here when it's time to go home? Hebrews 11.22 records, By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Joseph remembered that Egypt wasn't home. How's your faith? Are you remembering? Are you living like you are not home yet? As I mentioned at the start of the sermon, I'm homesick. And praise God I'm able to visit home this weekend. But there's a point that I want to make very clear. Well, yes, I love being here with the rolling hills and the warmer climate and all of those other things. That is not what I get most homesick for. When I first arrived in my dormitory room and while I was there talking with Dr. Lindsay, it wasn't the hills that I was longing for. There was one thing that could have happened right then that would have instantly cured my homesickness. And that would have been for mum and dad to have walked around the corner. Last October when we were visiting here, we had the opportunity to go and visit our our family home. The house that we'd grown up was on the market, there was an open home, so I thought I'll take the opportunity to go and have a walk down memories lane with my children, you know, show them our bedroom, where we'd run, where I learnt to ride the bike, all of those things. In a way, I was a little bit apprehensive because I was wondering, when I'm there, will those feelings come back? Will those pains of, of homesickness return? When we left the property, it, it was fine. Those feelings didn't come. I didn't feel homesick. And I know why. And the reason why was because Mum and Dad no longer live there. Yes, I miss this countryside, but most importantly, I long to be here because I'm with the ones I love and the ones who love me. They love me unconditionally and they only want what's best for me. When I'm home, whenever I can, I ring up and I talk with Mum and Dad. I love being in their presence. That is the reason why I love being home, because I love being with them. Do you long to be in the presence of the one who loves you more than you can imagine? 
Do you talk to him as often as you can? Do you set aside, a time, set aside time to read the love letters that he has sent you? If so, I imagine you are most likely homesick for heaven. True homesickness is a longing to be with those who we love and who love us. True homesickness is that pain of separation from loved ones. Do you spend time with God in prayer and reading his word? Are you homesick because you long to be with him in his presence? Or are you just looking forward to an easier life, streets of gold, playing with lions and tigers and having a great big holiday? Could I suggest that if the latter is your focus and that you're simply wanting a free and lovely life, in a heavenly garden, that you're not truly homesick, and that in the end you will end up being greatly disappointed. I'm planning to be home one day soon with the one who I love and who loves me, who loves me more than I can imagine, and I pray that you are, are planning the same as well. Heavenly Father, we long I long to be in your presence. Lord, we love the time and the way in which you talk to us through your word. Lord, we pray for the faith of Joseph, for the faith of Abraham. And Lord, that each day we might grow more and more in love with you and become more and more homesick. But Lord, that this homesickness we will take truly to heart and share with others the, the good news that Lord, it's not just us that you want to be with, it's everybody. And Lord, that you're longing for us all to be with you. This is my prayer in your name.